Hey everybody, welcome to the Ron Line Report. We have a guest today that was referred to us, to me, by none other than Sean Ray. Sean said, you know, you might not be too familiar with the name, but man, this guy's got some stories. And the more I looked into it, Sean was right. I love a good story. I love stuff that sounds like it's straight out of a movie. And uh, Larry Pollock, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ron. Now I want to start off with a little bit of uh, useless trivia. Uh, was the last time you competed the 2013 Masters Nationals? That would be correct, yes. Okay. We were both in the same show. That was my last show as well. Not only that, we were both in the same class. Over yeah, 40, over 40 heavyweight. 31 guys that year. Yes. I was so amazing they gave me 14th place because I'm, I'm that good. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, uh, yeah, we want to get into the whole story. You go way back into the scene. You've been a part of Southern California bodybuilding, powerlifting, the whole fitness industry scene out there since way back. You started training in 1980 at the age of 13. Is that right? That's correct. And you were competing and winning by the age of 16, correct? Yeah, I won my first show, Saddleback Valley Classic at 16. Wow. And uh, I saw you were, you were prepped by someone, some of the people out there, the older guys will remember, Mike the Zipper Sable. Is that right? Yeah, Mike was my first contest prep coach. He got me ready for my first show as a teenager. Uh, later, I trained with um, Lee Haney, Rich Gasperi, everybody down at Gold's Venice and World's Santa Monica. Yeah. And then I met Mike Menser, and he became my roommate, and I trained with him for about a year. Oh, we we got to talk more about that later, definitely, because that's he's somebody I was always fascinated with. I, I was around him a few times. I was always like too shy or intimidated to, to approach, and now unfortunately he's long gone. Um, so, 13 years old, I wonder what got you interested in bodybuilding in the first place? Probably like a lot of people, I was a uh, smaller kid at 13. I didn't weigh very much, and uh, my parents uh, separated. We moved to a rough neighborhood, and uh, my first day in junior high school, uh, they were having the busing from L.A., mm. so there was all kinds of race riots and whatnot. Wow. And, of course, uh, I was uh, 13 years old, so a lot of older kids, bigger than me. And uh, I, feel like, I felt like I had to do something to be able to defend myself. And I had a cousin that lifted some weights and had gotten pretty big, and it just... Coincidentally, I was right in L.A., and one of the first gyms I walked into, all these pros were training there. Hmm. You had, uh, Weeder was in Woodland Hills. Yeah. At that time, he had all the pros um, under contract, and they were all living in the San Fernando Valley, and there was a Gold's gym in Northridge. Yep. Uh, prior to being Gold's, it was Don Peter's gym. Yep. And uh, I remember the first bodybuilder I saw was Bertle Fox. Hmm. Uh, doing dumbbell presses with 150-pound dumbbells. Wow, what an introduction to bodybuilding. <laughs> yeah, I walked right into that. Wow. And then from there, you know, I just got to know everybody in the scene, and um, I was training right in there with all the guys training for Olympia and everything else. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people are going to want to know, especially the younger guys, you know, steroids were perfectly legal back then. Doctors were prescribing them, and... Uh, people were a lot more reasonable and moderate compared to, you know, it's like the Wild West now, obviously. Uh, in another interview I saw of yours, I don't know if it was the Rick Drayson interview or another one, but your first cycle was something that uh, I think even your average bikini girl now might laugh at. Can, can you tell us what that very first cycle was? My first cycle ever, I actually, it wasn't so easy to get it back then as a kid, you know, not the older guys, you know, were pretty hush-hush about it. Yeah. Uh, but I got somebody, I, I, I knew they were on it, I heard about it, and I wanted it. Yeah. So I managed to get a bottle of Cyril Anabar. They were the original little footballs. Wow. And they were two milligrams. Two milligrams? Two milligrams Cyril Anabar. And I took three of those a day uh, until I finished the bottle, which was about a month. Yeah. And I literally blew up on that about 20 pounds. Wow. And that was my first cycle ever. And you were how old at the time? 16. Did, did your parents have any idea that you were, they were using this massive six, six milligrams of Anabar a day? Uh, not initially, I don't think so. Well, I, 
definitely didn't tell my mom. Just to give the people out there, I'm, a lot of guys are very familiar with the drug and the doses, but this is a drug that pretty much only women use now or men toward the end of a prep. And the standard uh, pills that comes in the black market form now are 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams. Usually so, 20, yeah. yeah. And a lot of women, even in the bikini uh, division, are using 10 to 20 milligrams of that. So just to give you an idea. So Sean also tells me that I know you're a little younger than, than Sean and his contemporaries, but you were actually competing at the national level in shows like the Teenage America with Sean, uh, with guys like Franco Santoriello, Eddie Robinson. You know, how old were you and how old were these guys? Obviously, they must have been like right I'm at 19. I'm a year older than I am. So um, when I was 18, I went to the Continental USA. I won the light heavyweight and the overall title there. And then later that year, I went to Teen America and competed against Sean in the light heavyweight. And, of course, Sean won the light heavyweight. He killed me there. I would think Sean Ray would have, yeah. At the time, I didn't know it was Sean Ray. I just thought I got beat. <laughs> well, I don't think too many people knew who he was quite yet. Yeah. But still, he was. these guys are all phenomenal teens. Uh, it also just gives people an idea. You know, I rarely see any teenage bodybuilders anymore at the shows. Back then, can you tell people how big bodybuilding was at the teenage level? Um... I would, I would say that, um, like in a, in a class, a typical show, like say you went to the Orange County or the Cal, how many teenagers would be competing back then? Usually probably, you know, half a dozen to a dozen at least. Yeah, at least, yeah. I can remember shows where it was a couple dozen or more occasionally. So when did you make your way down to the Venice Beach area for the first time? You know, I was training... Uh, first, I was training at uh, Don Peters, uh, which became Gold's. Yeah. Um, and then I went over to Steve Davis Gym, yeah. uh, where Albert Breckles and them were training. Then I went back over to uh, Gold's Northridge again when it became Gold's Northridge, no longer Don Peters. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was training with uh, Lee Haney and Rich Gasperi. Wow. And they were all running running down to uh, Venice, you know, yeah. and uh, so I just kind of followed them, hmm. and basically every day I'd get out of school, out of high school, I'd get in my little Honda Civic, and I'd drive over the 405 <laughs> and go to uh, Venice. About It was about a good hour drive, Yeah, yeah. and I went to there to train at Worlds because that, to me, that was the place to train. That's where all the pros were going. Who were, who, were, who were some of the bigger name pros that were training at the World Gym back then? Everybody. Um, I, I would say most most of the guys trained at Worlds. A handful trained at Golds, but you had uh, Bertle Fox, Lee Haney, Rich Gasperi, Bob Harris, uh, even the older guys like Frank Zane, Samir Banu was training there, um, Danny Padilla. Uh, the list goes on and on. I think the only one that was really training at Gold's Venice at the time was Mike Christian, because hmm. he was like the nemesis of uh, Lee Haney. So yeah. they had opposing camps oh. down the street from each other. Because uh, when did real, when did Gold's really get going as the gym? It wasn't wasn't for a little while, right? Well, I think what happened was, you know, Joe Gold originally had Gold's, and then he sold it, and when he opened Worlds. Arnold uh, and everybody followed him to Worlds, right. and it was a little small gym uh, compared to Gold's Venice, not the huge thing that Gold's Venice is, but it was very serious, and um, it was like walking into a church for training. There was no music, uh, no, no banging weights, and Joe was real strict about everything, but everybody in there was training really hard for in competition. Yeah. Yeah. And pretty much everybody who was anybody, I think, was training there. Tom Platts, uh, I think, trained more at Gold's Venice. Okay. But some people went back and forth from both. Right. Now, I, I heard about your interview. You were on this show. There's a YouTube series called, uh, what's it called? Fresh Out Life After Penitentiary. And uh, your episode was called Kidnapped by a Cartel and Tortured for 16 Days, which is bad enough, but you already. That was later in life. At age 20, you had a really 
really rough experience. Uh, can you tell, tell us how you ended up being incarcerated for, you know, what is really some ridiculous charges when you look at it? Well, I, I will admit I was a little reckless when I was young. Um, I was big in the steroid uh, scene in Venice, and I was running around with my Jeep with the, uh, with the uh, no roof on and everything, yep. and uh, basically doing the Rambo thing. <laughs> and uh, it actually is pretty silly how it happened. Um, I at the time steroids were not. I mean, they were a controlled substance. Yeah. But they weren't illegal. It wasn't a Schedule Three like it is today. It was just a prescription medication. Right. So it was only a misdemeanor. So nobody made a big deal about it. Yeah. And um, I uh, got a connection where I was getting uh, real steris, uh, steroids in like huge crates straight out of the uh, pharmaceutical wholesale company. Nice. And I was pretty much supplying all of Venice. Wow. At, yeah, when I was like 18 years old. He's maybe 19. And um, anyways, it was just a fluke thing. Um, I had a girl living with me, and uh, we had moved into a place where uh, it was a trailer in front of my friend's building. And she borrowed the car to go get groceries, and uh, she didn't come back. Hmm. And in the meanwhile, uh, water was turned off in the trailer. Long story short, I'm stuck in this trailer in the middle of nowhere, um, and with no. And back then, we didn't have cell phones. Right. I'm talking like you know, six blocks to a payphone. So this is going on all night. I'm walking to this payphone, trying to find out where she is with my car. Yeah. Which happened to have a trunk load of steroids in it. Right. She was supposed to just go to the grocery store and come back. Anyways. Um, I finally found out where she was. I went over there, knocked on the door, and uh, they had called the police before I even got there. Police showed up, right away put me in handcuffs, and when they went and searched my, first they searched my car, and then they went and searched my house. They found um, a Mac 11 380 uh, submachine gun, and they found uh, several huge crates of steroids. Now, why, why did they, did, is this your girlfriend just was angry at you, or why, how did this all, how did the police even get involved in this? You know, it wasn't even like she was angry with me. She went off with some stupid friends, got high, they got loaded, the friends got on the phone, were cussing me out, and they were all high, and uh, I didn't even know what was going on. All night goes by, I'm still trying to get my car back, Yeah. and I... Uh, She's freaking out because she's high on something. Yeah. I, I go over there, the cops come, but they saw that machine gun and they just went ape shit on me. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I honestly did not need a machine gun. Most of us don't. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, some people question this, but, you know, I literally went to the Great Western Americana, uh, which is at the uh, LA County Fair, yep. which was a, a big gun show. Yeah. And they were selling, uh, basically, uh, Mac 11 kits. Hmm. And people have said, well, you can't buy a machine gun. No, but you can buy the kit. Right. And it's right. nothing to take the little kit and put the spring in there, and now you have a fully automatic machine gun. Right. So I saw, you know, Arnold on the Terminator had a machine gun. I thought, this is cool to have. And I bought one because I thought it was just cool to have. And, and let me say, when I was 20, I would have done the same thing. And I'm sure every other 20-year-old out there would have, oh, machine gun? Absolutely would have done the same thing. So what happens next? Well, then uh, they throw me in the county jail. And um, I think I had a $100,000 bond at the time. Hmm. And I had a friend of mine who was an HA, and he bonded me out. Well, they didn't like that, so they up the charges, put me back in on $2 million bond. Wow. And uh, they said they don't even try to make bail because we're not going to let you out. Yeah. And I think some of it was kind of guilt by association uh, because the H HA had bonded me out of, out of jail. 
yeah. or maybe who I knew, or I, I don't know why. They made a huge deal about it. What's an HA? Hell's Angels. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> well, that explains that. No wonder they were upset with you. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if it had to do with that, but all, the next thing you know, they're, attempt, they're charging me with attempted murder, attempted kidnapping, attempted assault, attempted everything. All these things that I was supposedly attempting. Yeah. Of course, nothing actually happened because all I was trying to attempt to do was get my car back. So, so yeah, I heard that in the other interview that it just doesn't even make any kind of sense. Is, don't they? What what, what murders were they attempt? You know, don't they need some sort of actual murders and witnesses and suspects to to bring all these charges on somebody? They're charging me with murder was all attempted. But who's murdered? They, were these people you knew? They said I was going to attempt to murder. My girlfriend and her friends. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. That makes sense. Now, when I went to the house, I was attempting to kidnap and murder them. Well, that would make sense. Okay. Oh, I actually never even went in the house. Right. I was at the front door. Okay. <laughs> so it gets worse. And, you know, I'm 20 years old, and when you get in the court system down there, you really don't know what's going on. And I had an attorney that uh, he told me um, it was... What is the term? Illegal search, uh, 1579 or something like that. He said, no problem. It's going to get thrown out. They don't have any case. They got nothing on you. Yeah. First day in court, the judge says, illegal search, smirch, you're going to prison. Okay. <laughs> and I turned to my lawyer and I said, hey, this judge is going to hang me. I said, we need a new judge. And he goes, yeah, you're right, but it's too late now. We can't switch judges. Mm. So... Uh, I spent about, uh, gosh, over a year there fighting that case, and they just kept coming at me with, you know, they were, at one point they offered me life and all kinds of other things. You know, you're 18 years, actually I was 20 years old, and you don't understand what to do right. and how to deal with this court system. And they're telling me, you know, if you don't take this deal, you're going you're gonna to be in there forever and whatnot. So they pressured me into taking this deal, which, you know, I regret to this day. Yeah. I, I wish I would have gotten a better attorney and fought it out. But, you know, obviously that didn't work out. So um, I took the deal. It was for uh, 12 years and I believe eight months. Yeah. And got sentenced, went to Chino, uh, which is reception center. From there I, I was sent to Corcoran which is, uh, was one of the really bad prisons in California, Yeah, considered a gladiator school. Oh. And um, it was pretty rough, I would say, you know, but I managed to hold my own and stay to myself. And uh, I got lucky, I got sent to uh, CMC, which is a medical facility, uh, because one of my, actually my mother's husband at the time was a psychologist, he knew another psychologist at CMC, and they got me pulled over there on an observation, and he pulled some strings, got me to stay there, hmm. uh, which was a really good thing because if I stayed in Corcoran that whole time, I don't know how it would end up. Well, I mean, let, let's back up. I, I, in another interview, you said L.A. County Jail, LA County jail is just horrific, which I, I've always heard that. You, you're forced to fight every day. I can't imagine things got better from there. Here you are. I assume you'd, uh, you know, even though you had a rough neighborhood and everything in your childhood, it had to be very traumatic for you to be thrown into that environment as a 20-year-old kid. Well, you know what? I grew up, like I said, they were doing the busing from L.A. Yeah. I don't know if you know about the Watts riots and all that. A little bit, yeah, a little bit. But they were, they were busing the blacks from the inner cities in L.A. into our schools, and we were having <laughs> race, race riots and whatnot, you know, this is inter introduction to junior high school. We're having a race riot. Wow. That dog. That's okay. <laughs> hey, Edgar, do me a favor. Close that door. Just close it, lock it. <laughs> Sorry. No I'm at the gym. People are, everybody wants something. It's okay. Anyways, uh, yeah, so there, actually, I grew up throughout junior high school and high school fighting with Crips and Bloods. Oh, okay. Uh, but, yeah, I, county jail was worse because, um, you know, this is not racist or anything, but at the time it was about, I think, probably 70% black, 25% yeah. uh, Mexican, about 5% white. Hmm. 
So if you're a white guy in the LA County Jail back in the 80s, you were a target. Sure. Yeah, right off the top. Hmm. You don't have to be doing anything. You're a target. Yeah. So you're literally going to be fighting with somebody over something or, or nothing for some reason at any given time. Yeah. So uh, how much time did you end, actually end up serving on that 12 years, 8 months? Um, I actually, I would have done, with half time, uh, I think it would have been about six years and, and change, but I, had, I actually had an attorney file an appeal for me in the beginning, which failed, and while I was at CMC going to school, I met some people in the law library, and they taught me how to do legal work, and I filed my own appeal, and I actually managed to get it, my sentence reduced by... Uh, a significant amount, but by that time I was only five months to getting out anyways. Oh. So I ended up doing, I think, about five years, eight months on okay. that one. Wow. And, you know, did you try to keep up? Were there weights at that, at that facility? Or did you try to keep up your training and your eating and everything? Yeah. Back then they had weights in all of the prisons, but especially at CMC, they had a really good gym and they had powerlifting meets every year. Uh, these people would come in from another organization outside, and they put on the powerlifting meets. And I got, and there were some guys that were real serious about powerlifting back then. Uh, so I got all involved in that, and I actually win all the powerlifting meets every year, hmm. which uh, they weren't real happy about. <laughs> you had these old convicts that had been in there training powerlifting forever, and here comes this kid in there winning all the powerlifting meets. But yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I was pretty strong for my bodybuilding training from I always did squats and deadlift and bench right so I, I just had that strength going into it cool. and yeah. uh yeah I would say I trained right through that and uh I can tell you right now that no drugs in there we didn't have steroids or anything just crappy food <laughs> uh, I don't think I don't even remember if we had vitamins back then maybe some cheap vitamins yeah um but got pretty big and strong you know just training because I mean, basically all I did in there was train and go to school. All right. They had Chapman College there, and I figured I have to do something with myself, so I enrolled in Chapman College, and uh, all I did was train, study, and go to school mm -hmm. the whole time I was there. Okay. So you, you get out, you're 25, 26 years old? I was 26, yeah. So what was your, what was your first move? Where'd you, you know, where do I, where'd you go from there? Well, I had a little bit to finish up on my degree, so the first thing I did was, well, I had a job lined up already in a law office when I first got out, and then I went to uh, Cal State Northridge okay. uh, to finish my degree, and I only had a couple semesters to do, and while I was at Cal State Northridge, I got, re actually one summer, I, I decided I needed to work a lot, so I got recruited by a knife selling company called Vector Marketing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably everybody's heard of it. They're everywhere. Yep. Um, and we literally would go door-to-door -door selling Cutco Cutlery. <laughs> and it wasn't really door-to-door, -door, but it was by appointment. But basically, uh, I ended up being real good at the knife selling job hmm. uh, because I didn't have a problem with rejection. <laughs> you know, if someone told me no, I'd just be like, okay, go to the next one. Yeah. And... Uh, I actually took number one in the nation in uh, sales mm. that year, uh, my first year selling knives for that company. Wow. And then they promoted me into a management position, and I ended up being a manager there for about 10 years mm. and did, did pretty well with them, actually. How did you end up uh, becoming not only a training partner, but a roommate of Mike Mentzer's? You know, that's really interesting. Um, as I mentioned, I was big on the steroid scene in Venice back then, and there was a guy who was uh, kind of a partner with me back then, and he introduced me to Mike Mentzer. And Mike Mentzer was somebody I always looked up to. He was one of, like my, one of my heroes in the magazines. I used to read the magazines from cover to cover. And I met Mike, and, um, you know, when I first met him, he didn't look like much. He was, you know, had a little pot belly, small, and... I convinced him to train with me. I told him, you know, I'm getting ready for Teen America and and train with me. And uh, so he agreed. And uh, 
I ended up moving in with him. I found out later so I could pay all the bills. <laughs> I was literally paying the rent, the food, and everything for wow. us. Okay. He would write articles for Weeder. I don't know how much they paid him, but I was paying. I was literally paying for everything. Wow. Um, but yeah, I trained. I lived with him and trained with him for a year. So did he get his size and strength back training with you or most of it? Oh, I've never seen anything like it. Um, and I'll even tell you right now, uh, the cycle we did was 300 milligrams of Duraballin every other day. That was it. That's DECA and Duraballin? Nan no, Nandrolum phenylpropanate, the fast-acting DECA. NPP, okay. NPP, That's, yep. You guys are just doing DECA on its own? NPP, 300 milligrams every other day. Hmm. That was it. That's all we took. Wow. And Mike, I swear, every time we went to the gym, he got bigger. Hmm. It was like, it looked like he put a half inch on his arms and everywhere every time we went to the gym. Wow. And within like three months, he was huge. Hmm. Now, and, is this, uh, were you guys training in his style, the heavy duty? Yeah, we did. We trained, we trained heavy duty, high intensity training, and it was pretty in, insane, actually. Um, Probably a little crazy what we did. This was our uh, our protocol. We would take a, an obitrol, which is a amphetamine with like several amphetamines in it. I guess it's sort of like a... Um, the sustenon of amphetamines. I think it's like an Adderall. Okay. And then we would uh, go down to the Nautilus, and there's an espresso shop there, and we take a double shot of espresso, two five milligram dextrin spantules. Oof. which were these fast-acting uh, amphetamines. And by the time we walked in that gym, we were so wired, we couldn't even barely sit still. And we, yeah, we literally went in there and trained like crazy people. Wow. And we would do like, you know, a couple warm-up sets, and then the all-out set to failure with negatives and four reps and the whole thing. Uh, used a lot of Nautilus equipment. And we really did train like that. So you had come from a background prior to that of training the standard way, I'm sure, like everyone else. Still, it's still it hasn't really changed that much. You know, the standard multiple exercises, uh, it, multiple actually, sets. It has changed because um, back then standard was not today's standard. Back then standard was everybody lifted heavy and trained hard. Mm. Even if they did, like, you'd see Bertle Fox. The guy would, you know, I mean, he might do more sets, but the guy was benching you know, 500 pounds and doing strip sets hmm. and shoulder pressing with 150, 180 pound dumbbells, hmm. you know, squatting 800 pounds for reps. Yeah. I mean, doing incline dumbbell curls with 120 pound dumbbells. Hmm. Wow. Uh, people trained really hard. Yeah. And so I don't know about standard, but everybody trained really hard and people use mostly basic compound movements and trained really heavy. I mean, everybody trained like that. Well, I don't know about everybody, but at least the pros. Yeah, right. Where I was at. I mean, you're you're talking about the elite. You were you were around a different, you know, a yeah. different level of bodybuilder. It, yeah, it's true. Everybody I was around was training for Olympia or nationals or something yeah. of that level. Yeah. But today, you know, I go to Gold's Venice and I don't see anybody train hard. Hmm. I don't even see the pros train hard. Hmm. They look like they're barely breaking a sweat. Yeah. Yeah. So today's standard and that standard was different. So I actually started out real young, training real hard. And uh, I remember when I was, um, I think, at 14, I was already squatting 400 pounds. And by 16, I was repping 500 pounds on the squat. And uh, can I can, can you give me an idea of what your, weight, your body weight was? Because I have a feeling it's about, this is about to get more impressive. You know, I had this one year where I literally blew up. I think it was between like uh, 15 and 16. I, I went from like 120 pounds to 180 pounds. Wow. Like that. Hmm. And then by the time I was 19, I was like 230 pounds. Wow. I'm a pretty solid 230 pounds. Right. So I got big pretty quick, but you know, like I said, we're all training really hard. That's the way we did it back then. Yeah. And eating a lot of food. I mean, people there, everybody trained and ate. And it was just a different atmosphere. You'd walk into the gym and you'd see Tom Platt's training hard, and Lee Haney training hard, and Gus Perry training hard, and everybody's training hard, so everybody trained hard. Right. Um, 
So maybe we did a little bit more sets than we did with Mike, but they were still training hard. Right. Well, I want to back up because there's always been a debate about, you know, the high intensity training with such brief volume and especially where Mentor was such an advocate of the Nautilus machines. A lot of people would, would have a hard time believing you could get a similar level of results. Strength, not so much. I'm sure strength wasn't as big a concern to most of these people making the argument, but size wise, were you able to look as good or even maybe better training with Mike than you had been before? Or how did it, how did it compare the results you got? training the heavy duty style to right to what you had been doing prior to that. I definitely got bigger. Hmm. I did get bigger. Um, my conditioning that year wasn't quite as good as it was the year before. Yeah. Now I don't know if that I don't think that really had to do so much with training as maybe the dieting. Right. Though, so, but I definitely put on size. Yeah, I got bigger. And I mean, it's not just Mike Menser. I mean Dorian Yates did the same thing and you saw what he did. Right. Well, it definitely it works. Um, nowadays, I do a little bit more volume, but I kind of follow the same same approach. Yeah. You know, I might do instead of one all out set two. Hmm. Wow. You so know, you, I, you've really kept that style of training more or less this whole time. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I've I've trained like that my entire life. Wow. Yeah, and I mean, I've, I've gotten up to an 820-pound squat at, at uh, 240 pounds body weight and a 555 bench. My deadlift kind of sucks. I mostly deadlift 635, but this guy has short arms. But you've continued to, to uh, powerlift over the years as well, the competition. Yeah, I always enjoyed powerlifting because it's just it's different than bodybuilding. Bodybuilding was my first passion. Yeah. You know, it's what I started off with, and it still is. But... Um, Powerlifting is just fun. Bodybuilding is not fun. I mean, I'm prepping right now for North Americas. Oh, and boy. I mean, I'll see you in three weeks. Then. Okay. Yep. <laughs> and I mean, I'm into it and all that, but it's not fun. Like, powerlifting competitions are fun. First of all, you can eat a lot, so you're not all <laughs> defeated and starved. Yeah. And the atmosphere is different. You know, you go to a bodybuilding show and backstage, everybody's cutthroat. And they're looking at each other like they, you know, they're all hate you. Yeah. And you go to a powerlifting, I mean, it's totally different. Everybody's cheering for everybody. Hmm. Everybody's patting each other on the back. Everybody wants to see people do well. It's such a different, totally different thing. So it's a nice break, you know. You go do some bodybuilding, you know, and then the off season, you go to your powerlifting, and it's, it's a nice break to get away from all that. Yeah. And it it does put a lot of size on you. That being said, uh, you know, I'm sure I've got my share of injuries, and I was never a power lifter. You must have several, several injuries that you've incurred over the years with these kind of weights we're talking about. I tore both my cruciate tendons in my knees when I was a teenager, still bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Not lifting weights, by the way, doing other stuff, football. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the doctors told me you'll walk, but you'll not run. But I was squatting 600 pounds a few months later. So, what do they know? Yeah. Um, I've i over the years I've had a torn rotator cuff, which I got repaired. I have torn a pec. Um, that happened uh, doing something stupid. I was one week out of a bodybuilding show, and I went back and power lifted. Oh. You know, and I was still all depleted and dry, even though you're full. Right. So um, I tore my tricep tendon. Uh, again, well, I think that was exacerbated by lifting weights, but I actually hit it on the cement. Oh, yeah. And tore that. Other just small injuries, you know, I've uh, pulled my abductors a couple times. Um, but, you know, oh, I had a really bad one last year. Uh, this was really bad. I tore both of my calves on a leg press. Oof. Yeah, they just blew out. I had 1,500 pounds on my leg press, which is not something I hadn't done a million times. Yeah, but the calves, cool. wow. Yeah, I tore both of my soleuses completely. And um, I was actually in the hospital in a wheelchair for several weeks. Yikes. Couldn't walk, couldn't stand up, couldn't anything. It was unbelievable pain. Hmm. Um, but somehow I've managed to rehab myself back from it. 
Yeah, and, uh, you're still kicking, you're still competing. <laughs> I, yeah, I went back, you know, as soon as I could, I started doing a physical therapy and I uh, started working on my calves and they're probably at about 90% of where they were before I did had the injury. Yeah, not bad. So, uh, before I forget, Sean asked me to, Sean asked me to ask you about a Victor Richards story where he was chasing you around a car trying to kill you. You got to tell me that story. Oh yeah, so you know Victor didn't have a car. Anybody who don't know Victor Richards, he was like the biggest dude in Venice at the time. Yeah. I mean, he literally made Lee Haney look small. Right. And we were about, the, actually he was a couple years older than me, I think I was 17, he was 19. And he also lived in the valley and he used to ask me to give him rides over to Venice because he didn't have a car to get over there. Yeah. So uh, I picked him up one day and I drove him over, we went over to World Santa Monica and uh, I went in there and trained for about two hours and Victor was in there just, you know, kind of like the way he trained, he'd like do a few squats, then talk for 20 minutes, do some bench presses, talk yeah. for 20 minutes, do something else, talk for 20 minutes. Anyways, I, I'm training, I'm done in two hours, and I'm like, okay, so I'm done training, I'm, how much longer you got? And he's like, I need to go over to Gold's. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So we go to Gold's, and he walks in there, and he's just talking to people, not doing anything. Yeah. And he says, I need to go to the beach. So we go over to the Venice Beach pit. Yeah. And it's like the middle of the day. There's hardly anybody around. And he's just walking up and down the boardwalk with his shirt off. And I said, Victor, it's like 5 o'clock, you know, and I got to go. I got to get back to the valley. Yeah. I said, I got to leave. I can't hang out here all day. Right. And he goes, well, I'm not ready to go yet. I said, well, look, I got to go. So yeah. you can come with me now or, you know, go back yourself. He says, how am I going to get back myself? I said, I don't know. Take a bus. He goes, you know how many buses I would have to take? I have to take six buses. I'm like, well, I don't know what, that's your problem. Yeah. But that's it. I kick your ass now. And he starts chasing me. <laughs> and he's chasing me around the cars, but, you know, he can't catch me. He's too big. He right, right. <laughs> and uh, finally he runs out of air. And I'm like, you want to go now or not? He's like, okay. So we get, in a, we get in the car. I drive him back. And he has me drop him off at Universal City. And um, he calls me later and he says, Larry, next time I see you in the gym, I'm going to kick your ass. Oh boy. And uh, so I'm talking to my uh, training partner, this guy, Glenn. He was a big 280-pound white guy. And so we're thinking, you know, what are we going to do with Victor? You know, this 330-pound monster is going to come in and kick my ass. So we were thinking we'll pick up weights and hit him over the head. Wow, wow, well, yeah. Anyways, one day I'm uh, in Nautilus in Studio City, and it's like a, the gym is like underground in a basement. Yeah. And I'm all the way down in the corner by myself on some machine training. And he yells at me from all the way to the other side of the room. He says, Larry! I look up and there's Victor and the whole gym just stops and stares because, you know, he's huge. Yeah. He goes, I'm very, very mad at you. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you mad at me, Victor? He goes, I'm very, very mad at you. And I'm like, okay. And he he says it again, and I and you know I don't I have a short temper. Yeah, you know, at that point, I yeah. said, look, either do something or die. Yeah. And he said, I'm very mad at you, and he turns and stomps up up back up the stairs. <laughs> yeah, Greg Valentino. He, he told a lot of stories about Victor. I've never heard a good story about Victor. I'm not saying he, I don't know. He was at, he <laughs> trained. I, I trained at the World Gym in Pasadena for a few years, and he was a member there very briefly. He was very very much to himself. But uh, I, he's just not a sociable guy. I never saw him like be friendly to anybody ever. Now he's well, probably gonna Joe, come look, come after me, saying you bastard. What'd you say about it? Joe so, Gold had to kick him out of the world gym because he wouldn't pay his gym membership. Right. I'm sure, he thought he didn't have to. He, he thought he didn't have to, and they had a rule back then: if you were a pro, you didn't have to have a gym membership. But he wasn't a pro, so Joe told him you have to buy your gym membership. Right. He didn't want to pay for it, so he kicked him out. Hmm. Interesting. And Joe wasn't afraid of anybody. He was a little scrappy old guy, I remember. No. So let's let's fast forward. How did you end up? Uh, how did you end up running this? What was at the time, the largest 
the largest, uh, what would you call it, pharmaceutical compounding company, underground lab, Stallion Labs. Was it based out of Mexico? Yeah, it was based out of Mexico. So it was the largest lab of its kind in North America, maybe even the world at that time, correct? I believe so, yeah. So how did that, how did that, you don't have to give me all the, all the details, of course, but how did you end up running that? Well, prior, what happened was um, a lot of people who, who have been around might know there was a guy um, in Mexico, Dr. Cohen, mm -hmm. and he owned several steroid companies. One was Quality Vet. Oh, yeah, Quality Vet. Uh, Animal Power. And there was one other one. I can't remember the name of it. And everybody thought these were competing companies, but they were actually all his companies. Was it Tokyo? Tokyo, that's right. It was oh, Tokyo, okay. Animal Power, and Quality QV. All, he owned all those? He owned all three of them. Wow, okay. And it was actually a smart thing he did. He had like the, the more expensive high-grade one, kind of the middle grade one with some different products and then a lower grade one for cheaper. <laughs> and everybody thought they were, but it was all him. Yeah. And he supplied, I believe, about 70% of the U.S. market at the time. Yeah. Everything came out of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And what happened was um, they, they talked him into having a meeting with somebody in San Diego. They picked him up over there. And he's a Mex Mexican citizen. So they didn't really have power over what he was doing in Mexico, but he owned a lot of property in the United States. So they told him, you know, if you sh shut down your lab, you know, we're not going to confiscate all your property and take all your assets and let you out of jail. They did, did keep him in jail for a while. Yeah. So I guess he made some kind of deal with the feds and they shut the whole thing down. And Mexico literally went dry overnight. Wow. Like it went dry. And... There was nothing to be had, you know, nothing, but I mean, bogus fake stuff people were coming up with, but it was like literally a dry void and all of a sudden gear was real hard to get. Yeah, I bet. And I had been with an ice selling company for, you know, 10 years and I just got out of it because uh, I just didn't want to do it anymore. Right. And I was managing a couple of gyms and I wasn't real thrilled with the way that was going. And I had this crazy idea. I said, you know, Mexico is wide open. Nobody's running it. You know, there's, I go down the pharmacies there, there's nothing on the shelves anymore. Yeah. Uh, not anything, not much like it used to be. Yeah. You used to go in a pharmacy in Mexico and they'd be just lined up with everything you could imagine, everything you could want. It's like Disneyland. Yeah. So, um, I, uh, decided, you know, that's better to do it down there because it's legal and I could get permits and all that. Yep. So I actually went down to Mexico. I got like the permits. I, I knew some pharmacists down there who I'd been do, doing business with for years. So I already had the connects down in Mexico. And um, I built this compounding lab and I had my filt presses and uh, all my filtration systems and I had imported my raws from China and we made good stuff, and I, I had every single batch tested by this lab in Utah, and I would post the lab results on my website so people could see that you know it was legit. And I always dosed everything 10% over on my injectables, and my orals were right on the money. So like if my deco was 300, yeah. I made 330. Commendable, so, very very commendable. Know that it was better. Well, everybody else had a different strategy. Their strategy was to dose it, you know, a little bit under so they could save a few pennies. Right. But if you look at it, the market was so huge, it's like, why not make a better product? You're still going to make 150,000% on whatever. Yeah. So I made a better product. Um, I became a board, um, what is it called? I was head of one of those boards, outlawmuscle.com, yeah. board sponsor. And uh, it just kind of blew up really fast. Mm. I mean, I, I had some connections within the industry, especially on the boards. Yeah. And, um, I only dealt with uh, wholesalers. I didn't deal with, even though I would get a million inquiries on my website from people wanting to buy, I wouldn't sell to them because I didn't know who they were. Right. And I, li I literally had six distributors throughout the world. Mm. And I only dealt with those six people.
Wow. And um, we were doing at times over a hundred thousand a week. Wow. What year? What, what what time frame were we talking about here? What years? Um, two thousand six to two thousand seven. Okay. And so, then um, Operation Raw Deal hit, and they started rounding up all the labs from all over the world. And I don't know if you want me to get all into it, but they actually got hush mail from Canada, which we were told was encrypted and safe, yeah. and you communicate safely on that. And they made some kind of deal with Canada, and Canada hush mail gave all the emails over to the DEA, wow. so they knew everybody's everything. They knew what everybody was doing. And mm -hmm. But I was still sitting back in Mexico, and I was like one of the last ones to fall. I was watching them all go. And I was talking to my partner, who was in Norway at the time, and um, we were just watching them one by one. Went, you know, we watched uh, British Dragon go down, and just all these different labs. Yeah, they pretty much got everybody. Right. And um, I was like at the tail end. And uh, right before it happened, you know, I knew they were looking for me because. My wife at the time had got a letter from some kind of DEA thing in one of our PO boxes in San Diego asking us to contact them. Hmm. So I think they were looking for me, but they didn't know where to find me. Or, But I knew I was outside of there. They couldn't extradite me from Mexico because I was not within their territory. And at the time, they didn't really have a case because I hadn't sold anything in the United States. Yeah, Everything I sold was in Mexico to the pharmacies in Mexico. Right. And then people would take it and do what they want. Um, but, you know, at that time, they changed all the rules on everybody, and they just did what they wanted. So they contacted the uh, Mexican uh, authorities, and I'm sure the DEA is aware of this. The Mexican authorities are the cartel. They, It's not like they work with the cartel. They are the cartel. <laughs> right, right. And... Um, it was weird because I had a I had this really weird feeling like it was about three weeks went by and there was no bus, no nothing. It was quiet. It was calm. Too and quiet. Had, too quiet. Something was up, and I had so much money coming in. I couldn't figure out what to do with it all. I mean, literally, we were picking up hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a week. Wow. Uh, at Western Unions and uh, uh, MoneyGram. Yeah. Which, by the way, is a huge mistake. Never use Western Union or MoneyGram. Okay. Duly noted. Go ahead. <laughs> so anyways, um, yeah, everything was quiet. and We had a big house on a, a beach overlooking Rosarita, overlooking the ocean. Yep. And um, one night, uh, I had actually, it was really hot, and we had just bought this huge air conditioning unit. Uh, to put it okay, we uh, we lost the Skype call. It happens every once in a while. We're going to continue right where you left off, Larry. You were telling me about the night you were abducted. You had a very noisy air conditioner, so you didn't hear anybody coming for you. So this is pretty creepy. What happens next? So, yeah, we had the air conditioning unit going, and uh, my wife and I are sitting in bed watching a movie. My door flies open, and in the dark, there's like 30 guys looked like SWAT uniforms, all in black with black masks. They had M16s with laser sightings pointed at my face from every single direction. Wow. And, um, you know, we're just sitting there like, about shit myself right then. Sure. And, uh, you know, I said to them, I said, are you the police? He said, yeah, we're the police. I said, okay, don't hurt her. And right then, they... Uh, hit me in the face with a rifle, threw me to the ground, uh, threw some handcuffs on me, put the machine gun in the back of my head, and they said, what's the combination of the safe? And at the time, I had a really big safe, like right adjacent to the bedroom. Yeah. But that was kind of a dummy safe. I didn't keep much in there. <laughs> and um, at first, I gave him a fake combination, and... Um, they came back and they said, what's the combination? They put the gun toward my wife and I told them the real combination. Yeah. So they opened the safe and they got out what they thought was a lot of money, which was probably 30 grand that was in there. Yeah. And um, some guy comes and says, we got to go, we got to go there, someone's coming. 
So they start to take me out, and we're going to this hallway, and there's this one guy there. I guess he's the leader of the, one of the head of the cartel people. He's the only one that didn't wear a mask. Hmm. Everybody else had masks on. This guy didn't care. And he says to me, so what's the combination to the other safe? Hmm. And I, I had, down below in the basement, I had a safe built underground, and it was like literally in the ground with a dial in it in the, under the cement. Yeah. And, um, it was covered up. But he knew about it. And um, then they said, we got we got to go. So they took me up the stairs, uh, threw me in the back of some kind of uh, van, and threw a sheet over my head. And um, I remember they were driving, and uh, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. My heart was beating so hard in my chest. Yeah. Thinking, you know, they're taking me to kill me. Right. And um, these guys were, uh, they, had got, they had gotten a small safe out of the big safe, and they, the guys that were that had taken me in the car, they had opened it, and they were all excited because they saw the 30000 there, which they thought was a lot of money. Yeah. So anyways, they took, took us somewhere, in, uh, actually me somewhere, transferred me to a different car, and then they took me to some safe house, which I think probably was somewhere around Tijuana, but I was blindfolded, so I don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, they took me there and I uh, went up a stairway into a little room that was just a little room with uh, basically a little uh, fold out cot with springs and real thin mattress and uh, bars on the windows and the doors and just a small room. Yeah. <laughs> and um, there was two guys in there uh, were my guards and uh, they would just, you know, bring me food and actually they treated me okay at the beginning mm. uh, they were bringing me decent food and whatnot taking me to the restroom and you know I had a blindfold on and they told me you're not allowed to take your blindfold off but you know I can't not look yeah. so I mean when whenever they're I can hear they're not around I'm like peeking under my blindfold I'm trying to see, you know, where, where I'm at, so I could see, because I'm thinking I got to get out of here somehow. Right. But um, in there, I had uh, ankle leg shackles on and handcuffs, so I really wasn't going to go anywhere. The head, the leg shackles were so tight they were cutting my ankles and they were bleeding. Hmm. Um, and you know, can't run or walk with those things on. Yeah. So there wasn't really much I could do in there. And. Uh, uh, the first night they just left me, and um, the second night, guy comes and uh, says, uh, "You know, so what's a combination to the safe?" And uh, actually, I had just installed this new safe fairly recently, maybe a couple months before, and I only had been in it maybe four or five times, mm. and it was such a tricky combination. He had this real tricky dial. That you had to really be real precise with to get it open. I would hope so. Yeah, because it had about two million dollars in there. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You need a good combo for that. <laughs> well, the reason I had the money in the safe, I actually went to Belize Bank and opened an account in Belize, and I started putting money in Belize Bank. Yeah. And I had put about maybe two hundred fifty thousand in there, and with about six weeks, Belize Bank contacted me and told me, "You have two weeks to get your money out of our bank, or it's going to be confiscated." Um, apparently, I, I realized looking back, I made a mistake. I had let uh, customers wire transfer money to my Belize Bank, uh -huh. and uh, I guess the DEA got a hold of Belize Bank and whatever they said to them. Yeah. So I had two weeks to get my, but at least they told me I could get my money out of there. Yeah. So I let. I didn't know what to do with the money, so I wired it all to Hong Kong and uh, China. Yeah. I just bought more product because. I had to do something with the money. Right. So then I had all this money coming in, and I just kept putting it in the safe. Uh, at the time, you know, people talk about offshore accounts and stuff like that. It, it's not like that anymore. Uh, you can't go just open an offshore account so easily and hide your money. It it doesn't work that way. They're they're complicated, and 
the U.S. government controls all of these little banks all over the world through their subsidiary banks. So there's there's no way you think you can hide your money in one of these little banks. It's not going to work. Okay. So anyways, um, he asked me a combination of the safe, and uh, I told I started telling him, well, it's really complicated. You know, you got to do this and that, and uh, he said, we're going to play a little game. And I was already blindfolded, but he stuffed gauze in my mouth, and then he wrapped up my head with some more ga uh, wrapping, yeah. covering me completely, and they started punching me in the head, um, like using my head like a punching bag, yeah. which honestly, that wasn't the really, I mean, it, I guess I was still out of it. That really didn't bother me that much, Yeah. but um, the guy pulls me down onto the, onto the bench, and he goes, now, I don't want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about your wife and your family. They're in a place just like this. And then this guy takes a pliers and grabs my toenail and starts ripping it out. Ooh. And uh, my whole body went into like, convulsions and stuff, started seizing up. I, I guess it wasn't coming out easy because he was just yanking on it. Yeah. And um, of course, I'm trying to scream, but you can't scream because you got stuff in your mouth mm -hmm. and he goes okay you, you ready to cooperate you're gonna tell us the truth and I'm like yeah 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 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so they take the stuff out of my mouth and he says okay so you're gonna tell us the truth I said yeah so what's the combination of safe well, I didn't even know the combination so I just made it up <laughs> I, just, I just started making it up because honestly I didn't remember what it actually was wow. I think I, I had it written down somewhere on something I wasn't exactly sure. Yeah. And he says, okay, you sure this is right? I'm like, yeah, yeah. So they told me, um, okay. Uh, they left, and then they came back. Um, well, they, those guys didn't come back, but the guards who guarding me said, oh, the Hefe is really happy with you. They got the safe open. Huh. As it turns out, they used a jackhammer, and they jackhammered it out of the ground. <laughs> And they got it. They got it out. Okay. And he said, "So they're really happy with you, and uh, well, they're they're going to let you go." Because they, they told me if I had given up the money, they would let me go. Yeah. I gave it, and so, and then they said, "Well, um, one night the guy comes. Uh, I had actually made friends with one of the guards who was guarding me. Um, sort of friends, as much as you could be. I mean." We're in there stuck, me and this guards, two guards for, you know, 24-7, so I'm just talking to them about anything and whatever, trying can, to... Can I, can, I, can I ask you, you were fluent in Spanish, I'm assuming, at this time? No, I speak very poor, broken Spanish, but enough to, enough to communicate. Okay. But they spoke good enough English, we could communicate. So I'm talking to this guy, and he's telling me his dream is to, you know, get out of, of the cartel and open one of these... Uh, uh, hotels where people go to have sex down there and whatnot <laughs> and I'm like oh yeah I can help you with that when we get done with this you know I'll help you do that you know I can help you do all that and blah 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 yeah you know, anything to try to get state get some information right and the guy comes to me one night and he says oh I got some bad news I'm like what's that and he goes well they're gonna move you and I'm like so they're not letting me go hmm. he goes He didn't say anything, and I, and I, he goes, I, I said, so what's going to happen to me? He goes, I don't know. And I could tell, like, he was, like, kind of bummed because, you know, they told him also if I gave up the money that they were going to let me go. Yeah. But even the people down there that work for the cartel, they don't like the leaders because they kill their own for just right. over small stuff. Yeah. So they came and, uh, they came and, uh, to transport me, they took the leg shackles off, and a couple of days before um, that, they had brought this kid in there uh, named Oscar, and he was a young kid, supposedly owned a restaurant somewhere, and they thought he had money or whatever, they are trying to get it out of him, the guy was crying for the first two days he was in there, and they also brought this big, huge fat man in there that just literally laid on the ground and didn't move, hmm. didn't move, didn't, didn't, didn't just slept the whole time. Wow. And um, they were asking, um, 
Oh, I asked them, you know, what's happening, what's going to happen with the fat guy? And they said, oh, they're probably going to kill him because his, uh, his sons don't want to pay for him, so they're just going to kill him. Wow. That's the way it works. If, you know, if the family pays, they let you go. If they don't pay, then you can get killed. Yeah. And they use this term, nothing personal, it's just business. It's all his business. So, anyways, they, they took the fat guy, Oscar and I, down, uh, put us in the back of another vehicle, told us to lay down on the ground. Uh, I think it was a van again, but I'm blindfolded again. Yeah. Put us on the ground, sit, stay laying down, had guns to us. And they're driving us somewhere far, I don't know where. And while they're driving us, they put me on the phone with my brother. Hmm. Anyways, um, anyways, at the time, they were in communication with my brother, and uh, they were trying to get more money right. out of him. So I, I'm talking to my brother, and uh, I said to him, where's Denise, my wife? And he goes, we don't know where she is. Oh. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't know where she is? Oh. And he said, I, we don't know. I said, well, you have to find her. And then I said, listen, I said, I don't want to die down here. And that was it. They disconnected me. Oh. And, um, and actually, my wife was with my brother at the time, but they wanted my wife oh. also. So they were trying to find out where she was. And. He wasn't telling them that he was. She was with him. Good. So I'm thinking she's dead. Right. Because he told me when they were doing the torture thing that they had her and the kids somewhere in a, another place, just like where they had me. Yeah. So, anyways, um, they take us to another place, and uh, we get out, and we're going through like um, I don't know a big yard, going towards the building, and the guy who is escorting me. Um, one of the little uh, guard guys, well, he was, I think he was a little higher up. Um, he was, he was, uh, he was like the good cop, bad cop guy. He was like the nice guy. Mm -hmm. He's like trying to be my friend while the other guys do the torturing and whatnot. So he says, so we're going to put you in a little hot Harry Potter hole. <laughs> and I'm like, what's the Harry Potter hole? He goes, oh, it's just like a little Harry Potter hole. You're just going to go in it and you're going to, it's going to be fine. I'm, I'm thinking this is like a grave or something. I don't I'm like, I don't want to go in the Harry Potter hole. Um, no, I don't want to go in there. Right. <laughs> and I, so they take us in, and of course, we're blindfolded, can't see anything. And they shove me into this dark hole way back in there, and they shove the fat man in front of me. Mm. And um, I'm feeling around with my foot trying to feel if there's a, a, you know, a, an ending or this, and I can't feel anything. And I... Uh, I'm in this black, dark thing with this big, stinky, fat guy, and man, he stunk bad. I bet. And I literally climbed over him, and there was a door there, and I leaned against it, and I just pushed myself out of it. Hmm. And uh, it turns out the Harry Potter hole was a closet underneath a stairwell. Yeah, you, you, didn't, you ever saw Harry Potter, the first one? I don't remember. That's where Harry Potter lived with his... Uh his adopted parents before he, you know, before he went to that school for wizards, uh, what to call it. Anyway, oh, so yeah. closet. Yeah, yeah. He lived in like a little closet under the stairs, basically. That makes sense. So that's what he was talking about. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyways, um, yeah, I pushed my way out of there, and they're like, "You got to go back in there," and I'm like, "No, I can't. I can't go back in there." Yeah. And I just wouldn't. I just like I, I can't go in there. And they, they kept trying to push me back in. I kept pushing myself back out. <clears throat> so they moved me into another room just across the hall from that where Oscar was. And there's just an open room, and Oscar was on the floor on one side, and I'm on the other side, and we're lying there handcuffed, blindfolded. And uh, we can hear the guards, you know, by their, they're always making racket with their machine guns and whatnot when they're walking around and talking. So when they're away, you know, I'm trying to talk to Oscar, and he, he's scared to talk, and he's like, don't talk to me, and I'm like, we have to talk. So anyways, we keep talking when they're not around, <clears throat> and I'm trying to figure out, you know, like, what's the best way to get out of here? You know, we got to get out of here somehow. And um, at night, uh, one night, they were asleep, and 
one of the jefes, uh, the leader guys, called them and, and was cussing them out for being asleep. So I figured this is probably our best sh shot, you know, when they go to sleep, we could probably, you know, do something. Yeah. So then I get interviewed the next day by, um, by uh, I don't know who it was, one of the leaders of them. And he literally takes a tape recorder and hanging from a, a string and puts it down in front of my face and uh, says, don't look up. And uh, they had me talking to this tape recorder. I have no idea why. <clears throat> They're asking me about my business and what I did and all this and that. And they asked me, you know, about the ephedrine. And I'm like, there's no ephedrine. <laughs> and he said, he said, well, we thought you had a ephedrine, you know, because you're cooking meth. And I'm like, look, you raided my house. You didn't find any ephedrine, did you? No, you didn't find any ephedrine. Because I, I don't do that. That's not my business. Yeah. So apparently what happened was somebody told them that I was in their territory cooking, you know, meth. Okay. <laughs> and and so that's why they went after me in the first place. Wow. It had nothing to do with the steroids. So this was all a big misunderstanding? Not totally a misunderstanding. The DEA or whoever fed them a false story. Okay. So they would get, went and got me. Uh, so how, um, did the, how does this all lead to, to them handing you over to the, to the U.S. authorities? Or how did you end up back in the U.S. and in jail? So anyways, we, um, they transferred us to another place. Um, a, no, a day later, they took us to another place. And we go upstairs, and it's on a second floor, and we're in this some room, sitting on the ground. And um, during that time, they were brought more uh, prisoners, or whatever you want to call them, uh, in there, and they were torturing people and doing all kinds of stuff. And I watched them kill one guy. Well, I didn't watch him; I was blindfolded, but I heard it. And Oscar was translating to me what you know he could speak Spanish, so he was telling me what they were saying and. You know, they, they uh, wrapped this guy up and uh, stepped on the back of his neck. And they wrapped him up in a sheet with a big cord around him and left him laying next to me. And uh, another guy they brought in, they just tortured him mercilessly for days. And uh, the whole time I was thinking, you know, we, well, first of all, they, they told me they needed another million dollars for my family. Right. I told them, there's no way you're going to get a million dollars for my family. They don't have it. Yeah. You might as well just kill me now because they, they don't have it. And um, anyways, they stopped talking to me hmm. for a couple of days. And I knew that was a bad sign. First, they were, <clears throat> they were trying to negotiate with me where they could get some more money. And now they're, they stopped asking me. Yeah. And um, I told Oscar, I said, we need to get out of here. And he goes, it's too risky. I said, you see what happened to that guy last night? That's, we're next. That, this is too risky here. So they had a rule that um, we, had, we could not stand up. And if we had to go to the restroom, we had to whistle mm -hmm. until a guard came. So one night I'm whistling, 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 because I really got to go to the bathroom. Yeah. And they're not coming. So I get up and I go look. And they're both, these two guards are sleeping in the room in front of us with the TV on. So I took myself to the bathroom, went to the bathroom, and when I went there, I went down the hallway and there was another um, door with bars on it. But I looked down in, down to the garage, down a stairway, and I saw a couple body bags down there. Hmm. And then I went back and I told Oscar, I said, you know, Oscar was talking about, I said, you know, they're asleep, we could just get out of here. And Oscar goes, well, I could jump on the one and you could jump on the other guy. And I'm like, nah. Oscar's is a real skinny guy, and I'm like, they have machine guns. And actually, while they were sleeping, I was like looking all around them to see if I could see their machine guns, but maybe they were sleeping on top of them. I couldn't see them. And uh, I said, listen, we could just walk right out past them while they're asleep. And he's like, oh, no, that's too risky. I'm like, well, look, I'm going to go for it. I said, you want me to go first or you want to go first? He goes, you go. So I literally got up. And I tiptoed out past these guards. Like I had like this much space between his nose and the door and the wall. Yeah. I I snuck past him, and 
I was sitting for so long on the ground that my knees were like cranking. Mm. It didn't wake him up. And I tiptoed down the stairway and got out and I was in a big courtyard and it had a huge fence around about maybe 12 feet high, um, a gate actually, and there was an electric gate that went up, but I didn't want to open it because I didn't want to make noise. Yeah. Sitting there looking where to get out and Oscar comes down and uh, I said, there's no way out. And he goes, lift me up over the over the fence and he was so skinny he pulled his hands out of the handcuffs wow i boosted him up and he scaled the fence and he went down on the other side boom and as soon as he hit the other side dogs started barking all over the neighborhood and oscar looks at me through the fence and he just takes off running so i'm like oh shit now i have no choice so i hit the garage door button it starts coming up i slid underneath there and here we are, it's probably like 4 o'clock in the morning, middle of the night, and we're like running down the street. I'm in underwear with a rag on my head and handcuffs, <laughs> like, and I'm chasing Oscar down the street. Yeah. And this like broken street full of like holes in it. I don't know where we were. <laughs> and, um, we run up on a taxi cab and he takes one look at us and just keeps going. Yeah. And um, so I... We run down into a, a bus depot, and somewhere in the bus depot, Oscar like disappeared. Hmm. You know, he went somewhere. Yeah. And I uh, ran off in the bushes. So, anyways, I run out onto this highway, and I'm trying to flag down cars, but nobody's stopping. So I'm running down the highway, and there was a taco stand there. So I run in the taco stand, and there's about ten Mexican guys eating tacos in the middle of the night. <laughs> and I said, I, I, "I'm kidnapped. You need to help me." And they're like, sit down, have a taco. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 I, I need to get to the border. Someone take me to the border. Yeah. They go, you want us to call the police? I'm like, no, 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 police. The police are the kidnappers. Yeah. So anyways, they, uh, <laughs> these two guys go, I said, I'll pay you, take me to the border. So they go, okay, come on. They, they put me in the back of a van, and I lay down on the back seat, and they go, which border do you want to go to? And I said, Oda Mesa. Because uh, Oda Mesa is a faster border. There's two borders going into Tijuana, and Oda Mesa is called the old border. Yeah. And you, you know, the regular border in Tijuana, you can wait an hour, hour, two hours trying to get through the line there. Yeah. So we get to Oda Mesa border. They drive me right up close to it, and I jump out. And I run up to the front, and the guard's standing there looking at me, and I'm like, "American citizen, kidnapped. Let me in." <laughs> and the guy looking at me look really weird. He goes. He goes, what's wrong with you? Why are you dressed like that? Why are you like this? I said, I'm kidnapped. You know, let me. <laughs> so they look at me for a minute. He said, I don't know. They thought it was some kind of hoax or something. Yeah. They come down. They, they take off my handcuffs. They bring me inside. And then they bring in the two Mexican guys that drove me. And they were starting to give them a hard time. I'm like, no, no, no. They're okay. They helped me. They, they brought me here. Yeah. And um, anyways, they give me a sack lunch. And... Uh, give me a blanket, and uh, they told me they called my family and that my family's coming. Hmm. And a couple hours goes by, my family's not still there. I know something's up here. Yeah. And uh, then FBI comes in and starts interviewing me and, and asking me, you know, what happened. All right. You know, I don't get into all the steroid stuff. I just told them about the kidnapping. Yeah. And that they kidnapped me and took me to this place and whatnot. And then they brought some Mexican police guys in there and they said they wanted me to go back and show them where the kidnappers were. Go back in there. And I'm like, hey, I'm not going back in there. With you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, no, forget it. And uh, the FBI guy says, you know, we can't make him go back. Yeah. So, um, anyways. Uh, FBI guy is finishing interviewing me, and DEA walks in and goes, uh, we're taking him from here. Hmm. And um, I'm like, and the FBI says, hey, what's going on? There's something you didn't tell me. And I'm like, I don't know. So DEA takes me out the back, and uh, they put me in a uh, plane car, and they're driving me to San Diego uh, to their DEA headquarters. And the guy says to me, he says, uh, so uh, what do you think of John Romano? 
And I'm like, he's all right. I'm like, he goes, you agree with what he says? Hmm. I said, some of it. He goes, what do you think of this and that? He goes, you know that this bodybuilding thing is a cult. I'm hmm. like, no, it's not. Cult. He goes, yeah, it's a cult. He goes, you know, you weren't supposed to come back. He goes, there was a bodybuilder in the morgue that was beaten beyond recognition. We were sure it was you. You weren't supposed to come back. And I'm like, yeah, fuck you. So anyways, um, they take me to the DA headquarters. And I get there, and my wife is there. And they, they put me in the same car with my wife and take us to another place. Yeah. Which I don't know what if they were doing that to see if we'd say something or I don't know what they were doing. Right. But they, they said they're going to give uh, like five minutes uh, alone with each other in a room, me and my wife. I don't know if they felt bad for her or me or, or I don't know what they were trying to do. Right. But um, they bring my wife in there and I, I just said to her, I said, whatever you say, don't say anything. Don't say anything. He said, I already told him I want my lawyer. So they bring me in another room and they said, um, well, you could help yourself, you could help your wife. And I said, what am I being charged with? Yeah. He said, well, it could be this, it could be that. I said, it could be. I said, how much time is that? He goes, could be five years. I said, I want my lawyer. And this other guy starts getting belligerent. He goes, no, he invoked his rights, that's it. So they took us down to the San Diego uh, Federal Detention Center. And my wife was on a hundred thousand dollar bond, and I think I was on a half a million dollar bond. Yeah. Um, but right away we bonded my wife out, and then I had to go to court because they were arguing for no bond. And what are you and, charged with at this point? You know, it was like conspiracy to distribute. They didn't really even have a case yet. Well, what happened was they were still trying to get a case together, yeah. and then when the Mexicans picked me up, they got me, and then they didn't really have a case. They were still trying to make a case. Yeah. So when we first walked into court, they didn't really have any anything real tangible stuff. So this uh, hoopla um, prosecutor walks in screaming, you know, international flight risk and this and that. And, Wants no bond and da 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 da. Anyways, I had a real good lawyer who goes in there and he argued for my bond and they gave me, the judge gave me half a million dollar property bond. Okay. So I got out on the property bond. And um, I was out on that bond for three years, um, wear an ankle bracelet. Okay. And I actually, they said you have to stay in Camarillo where your mom lives hmm. and get a job. So, I went to Camarillo and I'm looking around. Camarillo is kind of a dead town. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do in this place. And uh, so I said, I'll just open a gym. Hmm. People's like, you're crazy. You can't open a gym. I'm like, you don't know me. You don't know what I've just done. <laughs> I can open a gym. So I just opened a gym. Yeah. And um, we actually ran that gym for three years. And uh, I actually went and competed at the Excalibur that year with uh, with my ankle bracelet on. <laughs> That's great. And, it was right after, uh, actually, before they had got me, I was planning to compete at the Excalibur. And um, then when all this went down, you know, I went through all this stuff, and then the ankle bracelet was on me. And um, it was like a week before Excalibur, and I just went to court in San Jose for another continuance. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what, the Excalibur's in a week. You know what, I'm going to do it just to show these guys. <laughs> And uh, I called John Lindsay and I said, hey, you know, I got this angle bracelet on, but I want to compete. And he goes, okay. So I went up there and competed anyways. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just to do it. Yeah. And I wasn't really in the greatest shape because I didn't really, I actually hadn't planned to do it. I just decided a week before I'm going to go do it. Yeah. yeah. But um, anyways, I stayed out on bond for three years and um, ran the gym and it was just continuance, continuance, continuance. And then I finally had gotten some information. Um, they weren't very smart when they were putting their, when they were building their case, they were photographing my house inside, taking videos of my house inside, 
And it was the same time the cartel was in there digging the safe out of the ground. Hmm. So I had proof of all of this. Yeah. And they were like in there with the cartel at the same time, on the same day, doing all this stuff. Yeah. So I went to my lawyer with all this, when I'd seen all this information, and I said, you know, what are we gonna do with this? And um, I said, I wanna take this, you know, public. I wanna tell everybody what they did. And I wanna tell the judge and everybody, you know, they're involved with the cartel and the whole thing what happened. Yeah. And my lawyer comes back and says, okay, well, here's the deal. Um, they're offering you 24 months. And if you take the 24 months, they'll let her off. And I always told my wife, if anything ever happened, you know, I'd make sure she didn't get in trouble because she had kids and all that. Yeah. So I said, all right, I'll do it. So I took the 24 months and um, went to Terminal Island, in, uh, which is in LA, yeah. which was good because it's close to my house. It was in Pumping Iron, actually, briefly. Yeah, that's right. That's where the Arnold did the Pumping Iron film. That's right. And they still have that exact same little weight pin there at Terminal Island. It's still there to this day. Wow. Yeah, it's one of the few federal places they still have weights left. Hmm. So I went there and um, left my wife to run the gym. So can I ask, what, what did they actually convict you of? Conspiracy to distribute. Now the crime was, you were in Mexico the whole time. Correct that they that they were alleging all this at or they, you know. So how does a crime committed in Mexico translate to jail time in the USA? Well, some people in Northern California, who I never heard of till this day, I don't know who they are. Apparently, got busted with a lot of gear, and some of it was ours. Yeah. And they said you manufactured this stuff with the intention of it going to the United States. They had no, they not, they didn't catch us one pill, one vial, one shipment, one nothing. Yeah. They just said you had intention. And when it's conspiracy, it's like, okay, we said you did and you prove you didn't do it because it's conspiracy. Yeah. They don't really have to have any proof. Wow. Okay. But they actually said there was this one, uh, I think one package with like five vials or something mm. that they had gotten in a mail somewhere. Yeah. And that's what they ultimately it went down to. And originally they were talking about um, there was uh, 5,000 seizures uh, at U.S. Customs. We're going to say it's all yours. Um, and all this, we're going to say it's all yours. Yeah. They're, they're basically putting it all on me, saying all of this is yours. Right. And uh, they really didn't have anything, actually. The one thing they had was they had – a video of my wife in a post office on the same day that supposedly a package was mailed from that post office somewhere else. Okay. That shouldn't, that shouldn't really hold that circumstantial evidence. and I'm uh, very far from, even I know that. I wanted to fight it, but my lawyers were arguing with me not to, and uh, I don't think they wanted me to open up that can of worms, and the DA and them didn't want me to open that can of worms, so they just said, take this short deal, we'll let her go. And maybe I should have fought it. I don't know. Yeah. So you did 24 months, or did you get uh, a little less time? Um, I ended up doing 14 months on the 24 months between with good time and halfway house and all that. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, it wasn't a great place to be. You know, it wasn't the worst place to be. It wasn't a great place to be either. Well, it's halfway between horrible and yeah. not so horrible, I guess. All right, so we have to wrap this up because you've been uh, you had so many stories. So just to let everyone know, since then you've uh, opened, you, you got out, you opened up this co, co gym in Ventura, California. Co gym Ventura, yeah. Ventura, You're, yeah. Uh, you coach, you here. coach various type of athletes, bodybuilders, powerlifters. What other kind of athletes? Well, we're USPA certified training center. Okay. We put on uh, several powerlifting meets every year here. Wow. We always have really good events. I have a few uh, world champion powerlifters training out of here uh, that I've trained, and um, been training bodybuilders too that are competing as well. Um, I actually wanted a hardcore gym like the one Joe Gold used to have, yeah. and the people in the fitness industry told me, you know, you can't do a hardcore gym because you know you got to appeal to the masses. Nobody's going to want that, but I did it because that's what I wanted, mm -hmm. and it's worked. You know, we're doing well. We have about 400 members. 
People come from all over the place to train here. I mean, people literally come from Santa Barbara, which is 50 miles away, and Camarillo, just to train here because this is the only hardcore gym left, I think. Now, how old are you now, Larry, if I can ask? I turned 50 last year. Happy birthday. So, so I get this question. I'll be 48 next month. and So I'm going to ask you the same question I get asked all the time. You've been competing for many, many, many years, haven't turned pro yet. You know, why do you still do this to yourself? Why do you still go through the diet and the training and get up on stage in the trunks and, and do all that? Wouldn't you? Most people would have quit by now. Training is something that I've always done and I always will do. Um, it's just like, it's part of my life. Yeah. I've, I just, it's something I've always done. I love training and I'll always train. But there was, if there was no bodybuilding competition or any competition, I would always train. Um, I had no plan of competing actually. Uh, after the Masters Nationals, you know, I said, you know, that's it. I, I've done it all. I've, I've competed for 30 years. I've done everything I need to do. You know, there's nothing, there's no reason for me to compete anymore. Right. You know, and then I get this guy comes in, he's 60 years old, and he wants to compete. And he wants me to prep him. And he's been competing a couple shows, and so we pick a show. He's going to do Masters Nationals. Uh, actually, not, I said that wrong. Um, North America in the, in the 60 and over. Yeah. So I've been training with this guy for the last five months, getting him ready. And he's looking pretty damn good now. I think he's got a good shot. You know, he's in the 60 and over class, Joe Lindsay. Oh, okay. And um, anyways, I've been training with him and getting him ready and. I'm naturally low body fat. I mean, even when I try to gain weight, my body fat gets up to like three and a half percent. Yeah, it's just it's just that way all the time. Okay. <laughs> it's it's just it's like not hard for me to you know. Don't, now, do, I, you, do you not do cardio? Because if we find out you don't do cardio, a lot of people are gonna hate you. I, I'll tell you right now, I don't do cardio. Damn it. No, I don't do cardio. Oh, I, all it. I do is train heavy and I eat really clean. Wow. Okay. I eat a lot of food though, but I eat clean, but my body fat stays like three and a half percent. It just doesn't go up. Okay. So what I mean, we went to USA's last uh, couple weeks back. Yeah. Because I had a competitor competing in there in the uh, welterweight division. Came in really good shape, shredded, looked good. Yeah. And um, I'm sitting there and going, Joe's 60. He's going to North America. I'm going with him anyways because we already got plane tickets. Yeah. I couldn't get backstage passes at the USA because only competitors can go backstage. Right. Thinking, you know, how am I going to go backstage with him? And I'm thinking, well, I'm probably maybe three and a half, four percent body fat now. So we're 30 days out from the show, <laughs> and I'm already in condition, and Might I'm already going to be. I'm already going to be there. Might as well. I'm going to be there anyway. So, like, I said to Joe, I said, "How do you feel if I step on stage there?" He goes, "I don't mind." I'm like, all right. So I started keto like four days ago, and I started doing fasting cardio in the morning just to get the last bit off. Yeah. And you know, actually, the first two days sucked, but now I've gotten, I've kind of adjusted to it. And um, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'll be ready in two weeks. I have, I didn't have much to lose. Right. Yeah. So I'm, you know, like I said, I, I love training. It's something I've always done and always will do. Um, it's just my thing, and I figured I'm, if he can do it at 60, I can do it at 50. Sure. Okay. So we're going to go up there and see what happens. Cool. Well, like, I'm looking forward to seeing both of you guys. I'll, I'll be covering all the divisions for MD. Yeah, I'm uh, looking forward to it as well. Of course, I have to throw in uh, coverage will be brought to you courtesy of High Tech Pharmaceuticals, everybody. But uh, no, that that's cool. Uh, I, I totally get that. I know not everybody out there would really understand what you're doing and the motivations behind it. I totally get it and uh, respect it. And yeah, I can't wait to see you. So I'm going to wrap it up. But this might have to be a two-parter, which would be a first in, uh, <laughs> in almost 40 episodes that I've been doing. But you know, I don't know what we're going to cut out. So <laughs> it was just too much, too entertaining. So I'm going to have to wrap it up now. Larry Pollock, I thank you so much for joining us and sharing all this with us. The viewers have some cool stuff to listen to while they're doing their fasted cardio now. And uh, I will see you in Pittsburgh. So for the Ron Line Report, 
It's been Ron Harris with Larry Pollock. Thank you.